first of all, I think we are so so far in our infancy on understanding the microbiome, and it's so incredibly complex. I mean, look at that. We're still debating about cholesterol, and we've been studying that for, you know, a hundred and some years, yeah. and we still haven't figured it out. And so you're going to tell me we're going to now automatically know the right the right answer on, you know, a microbiome, which is infinitely more complicated, yeah. you know, with, with all the moving parts and different species and amounts change based on so many things that we can understand that now. I just don't buy it. So I have to think... I think that the most sensible thing I've seen said about the microbiome is your microbiome is healthy when you are. Thanks for tuning into the HVMN podcast. This is your host, Jeffrey Wu. Orthopedic surgeon, world record holding masters athlete, US Air Force veteran, and hardcore carnivore. It's none other than Dr. Sean Baker. He's basically today's de facto spokesperson for the carnivore diet. And Sean is an interesting N equals one case study of someone not only following the diet to improve health problems, but also actually seeing performance gains. Sean and I discuss how carnivore has impacted his biomarkers, the effects of meat on gut permeability and microbiome, and grain versus grass-fed beef. Hey there, listeners. Dr. Brianna Stubbs here. By visiting www.hvmn.com forward slash pod, you can get 15% off our HVMN performance supplements line, a selection of supplements that targets the essentials of energy, focus, memory, sleep, brain health, and metabolism. It's a well-rounded nootropic kit that's meant for anyone looking to take their performance and well-being to the next level. Of course, make sure you're on top of the fundamentals, sleep, nutrition, exercise, there's a good chance you can get to 90% of where you want by optimizing the basics first. HVMN performance supplements can aid you in getting that remaining 10% from human to superhuman. The link to the offer, www.hvmn.com forward slash pod is included in the show notes. As a business run podcast, this is the best way to directly support the show and our work. Of course, writing reviews and sharing the show with your friends are just as appreciated. Without further ado, enjoy this week's episode of the HVMN podcast. Sean, hey, thanks for coming on the program. Pleasure to be here. Should be fun stuff. Yeah. So as you know, uh, our community is very interested in human performance. A lot of our listeners have experimented with intermittent fasting, ketogenic diets. And I, I think we really see you as really just taking this perhaps sub-thread of keto or it's completely a new cohort or a new community of folks looking at carnivory only eating meat. Uh, so I'd like to dive deep into some of the science and the data there, but perhaps just to begin the conversation, let's talk about your N equals one. Uh, How did you get into it? Uh, what's your current protocol? Kind of the high level here. Sure. So, I mean, you know, I, you know, I'm 50, I'm about to turn 52. So I've been an athlete my whole life. When I got into my mid forties, you know, even though I was still very heavily, uh, involved in high level athletics, I, I did I just noted my health was declining. You know, I was running into difficulty with with energy, fatigue, not sleeping well, developing metabolic syndrome. You know, I was heavier than I needed to be. I then, you know, embarked on about a six year journey into nutrition, you know, starting with what what I thought was the right thing to do as a physician. And I would I would I went on a low fat, low calorie diet. I you know, I increased my exercise output and, and I lost weight. I mean it was it, you know, that that certainly works. And uh, you know, so I dropped about Oh, I went from about 285 pounds to about 235 in about three months. So I dropped about five pounds pretty quickly. Um, and so, but, but, you know, once that happened, I, I found that I, I just couldn't sustain that type of diet. I mean, I just, you know, I just, I just wasn't able to do that. I couldn't stand being hungry all the time, which is really what was going on. I mean, I'm very disciplined. I've been disciplined my whole life to, to been able to succeed in multiple areas, but, uh, I found that, you know, eventually, you know, eventually you got to respond to your hunger. Eventually your biology is going to you know, ask, ask of you and you have to return to that. And so then I, then I, you know, I progressed through different diets. I went onto a more paleoish diet, um, felt a little better with that. Started, you know, reading some of the literature out there on low carbohydrate diets, you know, uh, read several books, experimented, felt good with that. Eventually ended up on a ketogenic diet, which I did for about, oh, two and a half years. And, and I, you know, and generally was doing well. And then I just continued to read and, and kind of stumbled upon this community of people that were doing an all meat diet and then kind of looking back into some of the, you know, some of the historical and anecdotal stuff that, that pointed to it as possibly being a little, little more uh, superior and particularly with regard to athletics. So I experimented with that. Uh, I did that initially at this time I'd started posting online. So I had, you know, a small following, but I just kind of as a joke almost that I'm going to do a 30 day carnivore 
experiment. And right. you know, we we had a, we had a, kind of had fun with that. People told me I was going to die of scurry. My colon was going to come out. My arteries were going to clog them instantly. And you know, obviously, none of that stuff happened. And so I did it for thirty days. And, and at the end of it, I said, "Well, that's been a pretty cool, cool experiment." And then I went back to my kind of more normal diet for a short period of time. And, and honestly, I just didn't feel as good. And I said, "Well, I really." didn't miss eating a bunch of salads and spinach. I, I really, you know, it's nothing I really craved, uh, you know, even to this day. I mean, you know, honestly, if there's anything I would say I'd want to eat would be some dessert, I mean, you know, yeah. if I'm honest about it. But I mean, so, so I, uh, you know, I just continued with doing that. And now I'm, you know, approaching my second year. Uh, you know, I've been uh, all about 23 months uh, on, on a fully carnivorous diet. Uh, mostly consists of red meat. Mostly it tends to be the fattier cuts of meat, which kind of you know, more closely mimic, you know, a ketogenic style of eating, you know, not necessarily quite as fat intense, you know, I'm not, my macros probably aren't up around the 80% range or probably, you know, from fat, fat caloric standpoint, they're probably run from 60 to 70% on most days. But uh, that, you know, and for me, that caused some interesting things, you know, as as a, as an orthopedic surgeon, you know, I was very acutely familiar with uh, musculoskeletal problems. And I'd had a few of my own as I, as I, like I said, I've been an athlete all these years. And as you get older, you know, these aches and pains creep up on you. And I noticed some things that I had had for a decade or more that, you know, were just, you know, I had resigned myself that I was just going to have to deal with this, you know, this little bit of pain and, and, and injury and work around that. I mean, those things just resolved and completely went away, which, you know, they had done somewhat on a ketogenic diet, but I just noticed complete resolution on a, uh, uh, fully carnivorous diet, which I thought was very intriguing, very interesting. Uh, you know, then I started, you know, exporting this to other people and seeing similar results, which I, I still think is, is very, you know, worthwhile of a tremendous study. And I think that's going to happen in the near future. I'm trying to help make some of that happen. Like RCT style, just try to get it through peer review. Yeah, that, you know, obviously that's a, that's a, that takes some funding. I've done some right. online stuff where we just collected data. We had people run 30 days, 60 to 90 day experiments you know, assessing what they were doing, you know, you know, at least, at least subjectively and, and the results tend to be pretty good. So yeah, it would be nice to get some more, you know, more, uh, bona fide studies done on this stuff. I think that needs to happen. I think it will happen. I think there's interest now. I think there's enough anecdotal stuff that's coming in all the time that, that some is going to force someone's hand to, to take the plunge. In fact, uh, a researchers contacted me today about launching a study. So I got to look over his proposal, but, um, the other thing I noticed for me in particular, and again, like I said, I've always been an athlete. And so, I've been training, you know, literally for 40 years. You know, I'm not a novice. I'm not a newbie to this stuff. I've been training at a high level. And I noticed, for me, a relatively significant gain within a several months after adopting a fully carnivorous diet. And I, you know, I calculated, you know, my performance output in a couple of metrics. One was, you know, deadlift strength, which I've been doing for my whole life. I've, I've always been a very good competitive deadlifter. And I noticed, again, about a 7 8% increase in, in strength without any change to training uh, style or, or intensity. Just from shifting in a carnivorous diet. Just shifting mm-hmm. on a diet. And the same thing I saw in my rowing, as you may know, I'm a competitive indoor rower, which you know, is kind of a crazy oddball sport, but it still right. is very physically taxing. And I saw about an 8% increase in my power output. And I'd already had an American record in that sport you know, as a 49-year-old. And then when I went to as a 50-year-old, I increased my record by you know, several seconds you know, on a 500-meter row, which is actually quite a bit of improvement, you know, just by changing the diet without any significant change in training style. So, you know, health improvements, uh, athletic performance improvements, you know, I, you know, I know you, you probably are big into cognition. You know, yeah. I think that, uh, you know, some people will debate and say my cognition is very poor depending <laughs> on who you talk to. Yeah. I think that that works very well as well, you know, and, uh, so that, that's, that's been my story. That's super interesting. And I think it's remiss to not talk about the sociological phenomenon. It sounds like there's definitely like a meme coming up, uh, within the last, I would say six months, 12 months where, uh, it's really captured folks in Silicon Valley and in our community where, you know, what, what's the difference here? And it kind of reminds me of what happened with intermittent fasting and maybe keto, maybe like two, three years ago. I mean, uh, can you comment? Uh, what's what's the sense from your perspective where you're oftentimes seen as the godfather or, you know, a, a, like like a spokesperson that talks about this this diet? I mean, what's it like been for you personally as you're just sharing your n equals one and then collecting data yeah i mean i want to give credit i mean there are many people that have done this before i before i did that you know i mean obviously the first guy that probably did it was some 
you know, uh, homo erectus guy. You yeah. know, that's where it probably originated if we, if we really want to be honest about this. But this, this has gone in and out over the years. You know, Dr. Salisbury back in the 1800s, who's, you know, his, his steak is named after him. You, some of you guys might remember mm. it from TV dinners. He's awful TV dinners. It featured the Salisbury steak. But I mean, you know, going back to, you know, go, guys like him and uh, Blake Donaldson and, you know, even Mike Eads has kind of touched on that. You know, there's people that have been kind of dancing around this for years, Barry Groves. Uh, so this is not by any means a new thought, you know, yeah. there's, there's very few new thoughts under the sun, obviously, but I think that, you know, I think it certainly ties into the ketogenic intermittent fasting. I mean, so obviously and inarguably there are people that get good results from those strategies. And I think this, you know, has some features that are shared with that. I think that's certainly the case. I think we're finding that the current sort of paradigm of the way humans get their nutrition these days is is not compatible with how our species evolved i mean i think this round the clock access to food this you know snacking every two or three hours in an effort to keep your blood glucose uh, you know up to a certain level at all right. times you know is is kind of our downfall and then and then not to say the the foods that are available the things that have been introduced in the human diet particularly over the last 50 to 100 years have, have certainly been deleterious. Mm-hmm. so this again you know when you get rid of that stuff and you know if you're doing a ketogenic diet correctly you know hopefully you're not filling it with a bunch of processed keto products you know right. you're, you're you're sticking to whole foods uh you know intermittent fasting obviously you're you're if you're not eating you're not eating junk food you know and a carnivorous diet in the same same sense you're not eating junk food i mean some people will argue that meat is dangerous and bad and causes heart disease and increases your risk of uh, colon cancer and all that stuff i disagree with those things but i think at its very core um, it is a, a, an incredibly nutritious food. I think humans are ideally adapted to it. I think our evolution was driven that way. Uh, but as far as the social aspect of it, yeah, I mean, certainly it's been taking off. You know, you know, obviously social media is is a game changer. I mean, I think a lot, you know, you're, we're involved in this right now. This is right. on social media. People listen to it. This is how people get their information these days. They're not waiting for the guy in Harvard to stand up on his Right. You, know, you know, at his podium and, and read the latest study to you. I mean, that's just not happening anymore. So people are taking it into their own hands. I think there is a democratization of either medicine or health. And I think it's a good thing. I mean, I think there, you know, certainly there's some negatives that come out of that. And social media has a lot of negativity associated with it. But at the same time, I think there's some uh, good that come out of this. And I think we're seeing that more and more people are sharing the stories. We now have the ability for millions of people to say, hey, I tried it and it worked too. And then, you know, ultimately the cream will rise to the top. You know, yeah. ultimately some of the stuff, you know, whether this lasts five years or one year or 10 years or a hundred years, I don't know. And, you know, if it, if it stops working for me, I'm not going to stick with it. I mean, that's, I mean, that's, that's the bottom line. I'm, I'm doing what works well for me and makes me perform and, you know, hopefully keep in good health. And so that is, uh, you know, ultimately what's going to happen, you know, if something works well, people find out about it, more people do it, it works well, they continue to do it. hundred percent. You know, certainly some people are doing it for the novelty, for the fun, for the curiosity. Many people don't need to do this. You know, I've been accused of saying everybody in the world needs to do this and there's nothing farther from the truth. I said, this is an option for you. If it works well, and it may or may not, in many, many cases, it seems to go ahead and try it. There's nothing wrong with it. I mean, what, what great risk is there for, for eating a bunch of steaks for a couple of months? I mean, I, I just don't see the the big problem with that. And, and, and if you decide you want to continue doing that, good for you. If you don't, then do something else. Yeah, 100%. I think just like the most open-minded scientific approach. I think if people are afraid to even ask the question, which I think some folks in traditional medicine or traditional nutrition are scared to even like open the question or open the Pandora's box. And I think that's unscientific. And I think 100% what you're talking about around opening the discourse, looking at data, um, that's that's a scientific method. That's a scientific process. And I think it sounds like you're not dogmatic on this. And I think in nutrition Twitter, or just like people that love keto, hate keto, hate carnivore, love vegan, I, I think it's very easy to get into this holy war. And I think end of the day, I, I 100% agree with what you say. Cream rice to the, to the top. Like if this, if if it doesn't work for people, if this makes you feel like crap there's no, you're not making money off of like telling people to buy steaks and not eat, you know, salads, right? It's just like, we think we have something that's interesting, whether that's, you know, a set pattern of eating or a set protocol. We just want to share it. That's generally the case. You know, I think there is um, some, you know, there there are some nutritional folks and I, I'm, I'm going to pick on the vegans here a little bit that, that absolutely will tell you, we think other people should not eat, you know, 
any other way than what we do. You know, and they, they, they tie it into ethics. I, I don't have any belief in that. I'm not worried about saving the world's tomato population. I mean, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's, again, it's do what works well for you, you know, with, with regard to your health. And I think that's the only point we're making here. And, you know, this, you're very right about scientific method. You know, you make an observation, you know, if I've got 20 people to tell me their Crohn's disease went away when they gave up eating fiber and plant food, then that's a valid observation. We shouldn't just say, that's crazy. Oh, anecdotal, like it's worth nothing. It's a it's right, signal right. to run a study. It's a signal to run a randomized controlled trial. That's the exact case. And you know, yeah. what I'm doing right now is I'm collecting a lot of anecdotes, certainly. And I think those are powerful. I mean, the reason you and I are talking right now is because of anecdotal data yeah. or anecdotal stories. And I, and I do believe that's an incredibly powerful tool. And I think that's why I encourage people to, to submit those stories. And I've, you know, I've created a website called meatheels.com. You know, the name's kind of goofy. People make fun of that, but it's catchy. It's, it's short. It's, it's easy to remember. You know, you, you may disagree with the, the, the exact sentiment of the message, but it, it, it focuses people on the fact that these guys are eating a carnivore diet and good things help things happen to their health. Rather than dismiss that, we should be saying, wait a minute, let's test that. Maybe there's something there. Maybe there's something in the diet and, and you don't, we can find out what's causing the problem. We don't necessarily have to have everybody on a carnivore diet, but maybe we can find out. Maybe it's those damn vegetable oils. You know, maybe it's uh, you know what you know whatever component in the diet that's causing it. Maybe it's the oxalates. You know, I don't know what it is yet. Right. But at least we can say, okay, we've got a platform, a baseline to start from. Now we can start investigating this stuff. And just because we don't understand everything about how something works, you know, there's people out there saying you got to understand the the mechanism. And Rhonda Patrick was on Joe Rogan's podcast. You got to know the mechanism. Well, I'm like. That's fine. Find out the mechanism. But in the meantime, there's people that just want to get the results. Yeah. And I am, you know, as a physician, I'm interested in results. And most people are interested in results. The mechanistic uh, information can come later. And I don't think there's any reason to tell some person that, hey, this is working. Try it. If it works well, great. We can figure out the mechanism later. Maybe, maybe we can find out a mechanism. And then suddenly there's other alternatives. Right. But for now, you know, you do it, you do it works. I think one what question would be, okay, like while we are understanding the mechanism, how, how are the biomarker data? How are your blood panels? Uh, how are the quantitative measures of how a carnivorous diet is affecting you versus the subjective effects? I'm sure you're collecting data on, you know, LDL, HDL, sure, triglycerides. Sure. Uh, yes. What's your sense on how a carnivorous diet is affecting? I can talk about my specific data and I can yeah. talk about the general data that I've received from, from hundreds of people. And I say, you know, in general, uh, most people will see an improvement in things like their triglycerides. You know, and that's consistent with multiple low, low carbohydrate diets, which we know, which which, yep. which isn't surprising. That makes sense. Most people will see, you know, a little bit of a rise in HDL, which is also, uh, you know, pretty much expected. I think the, the LDL cholesterol, the total cholesterol, uh, it variably, some people see a pretty precipitative rise. Some people see no change at all. Some people even see a decrease. So I think that's been a variable response. In my particular case, my cholesterol didn't do much. I mean, my LDL total cholesterol was was about the same as it was five years ago. My HDL went up slightly. My triglycerides came down quite a bit. Um, we are seeing in general, again, most people will see markers of inflammation, both clinically, you know, with regard to joint pain. C-reactive protein. C-reactive protein coming down. You know, mine was 0 0.6 or 4. I can't remember the last time I yeah. checked it, but very low, you know, high sensitivity C-reactive protein. And that's generally what I'll, what I'll see consistently. Uh, we'll see uh, markers of, you know, sort of liver function. Generally, those are normal. They, they don't see any rises in there. Yeah. Uh, we see that uh, uh, iron studies tend to be normal. You know, you know, one of the concerns was you'd be, you, you, this is a, obviously a very high, high iron diet, you know, full of heme iron, particularly if you're eating mostly red meat. Iron studies tend to be normal. The ferritin levels tend to be normal. Uh, you know, those things are interesting. Blood glucose for most people tends to be uh, very stable and generally tends to be a little bit lower. Most people that have, uh, a number of diabetics have done this, have seen pretty remar remarkable drops in their hemoglobin A1C with good uh blood glucose stability, you know, where, where they don't have these big post right. rises. And fasted insulin as well. Fasted insulin tends Just to be lower down. as well. Yeah. You know, mine, mine was down around 2.6, you know, it was very low. Mm -hmm. uh, the interesting thing about my particular data, and this, this raised a lot of red flags, was my, my glucose was actually fairly elevated. It was around 125, 126, I believe. Which is like pre-diabetic diabetic. Which is pre-diabetic, which yeah. is very interesting. And so, of course, that got my attention. So, I, I, I basically started getting a, you know, glucose monitor and checking it all the time. What I was seeing is that 
my gl- blood glucose postprandially was very low. I mean, it would be, you know, 85, 90, and then it would go up two or three points, maybe five points or even drop. And so what I noticed huh. was it was very stable, but I still wanted to reconcile the fact that, you know, we've got this higher fasting blood glucose. And so when I look through the literature, it's very interesting. Now they're testing athletes with con- uh, continuous glucose monitors and they're seeing, there's a nice study, I think it came out in 2016, the exact tell I can't remember, but it was something like uh, uh, glucose levels among sub-elite athletes using a CGM. So if you look at that study, they found that about 40% of their athletes actually had blood glucose readings in the, you know, the pre-diabetic and diabetic range, you know, it, 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 something like 60 to 70% of their blood glucose was there. Mm-hmm. And these guys were in shape, lean people. And, and interestingly, the ones that had the highest prevalence of that were the guys that were eating the lowest carbohydrates and exercising the hardest. And, you know, yeah, well, we, I had another researcher on by the name of Alexander Fer, uh, Ferretti, who was on my podcast. We've got a podcast, myself and Zach Bitter. Yeah. And he's he's done research on Olympic level athletes, and he's seen the same phenomenon. Guys that are very athletic, particularly involved in high intense sprinting type activities, which is exactly what I do, will see an elevation in their blood glucose. But I mean, my blood glucose, although it was elevated, um, I saw tremendous, you know, insulin sensitivity. My HOMA I, IR score, you know, yeah. was zero point eight. You know, if you calculate triglyceride glucose index, it was eight point one. All these measures show extremely good insulin sensitivity. And how about your hemoglobin A one C? Was that elevated as well? It was elevated to okay. like six. It was like six three. So I mean, I don't doubt it was. You know, it was elevated, which is interesting. But, but again, like your insulin levels low, which is why it's like very interesting because typically you would expect right. both to be uh, right. directly linear. If you have diabetic pathophysiology, you know, you you will see that your insulin will be rising, and that you know, initially it's high. Yeah. You know, there, some people argue, well, then you're a burnout diabetic, you know, you're sick. And then I'm like, well, I'm breaking world records on a, you know, athletically. So yeah. that doesn't jive. Um, but, but, you know, outside of my case, generally the situation has been um, that most people find that their glucose, you know, tends to be very, very stable. You know, if you, if you hook them up to a CGM, I mean, it's a flat line. It really is. There's almost no bump. You know, what we see is with, with protein in particular, because, uh, you know, a carnivorous diet tends to be higher protein you'll see that the glucose tends to rise a little bit lower. Instead of that half hour, hour spike, you'll see something more along the four to five hour range. But, but again, it tends to be very gradual and very low. You know, there was a nice study, I can't remember which year, I think maybe it was in 2000. Oh, I, I'm blanking on the, on the year now. But they looked at fasting versus a zero carbohydrate diet. Yeah. And they looked at the response of glucose, insulin, a C-peptide, and they saw that the, 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 uh, the fasting line was very similar to the to the to the no carbohydrate line you know the meat based line you know the, the line with 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 meat showed a little bit higher amounts but overall it was very low you know they, they very very much showed a very low steady you know low peaks you know not high levels of glucose not high levels of insulin which i think again we can talk about what's causing pathophysiology what's causing this age i think many people at this point believe that keeping insulin levels steady, you know, and avoiding these high levels and glucose levels really high right. is probably ultimately the best thing to do. You have like the like the area under the curve rather than right. uh, as opposed to any just spot check. Um, interesting. Have you looked at, at ketone levels as something that you guys are tracking, whether yourself personally or within the community? Not myself personally, just because it's not something that I personally wanted to, you know, to, to, to play with. I don't find that it's a... Uh, you know, the problem with ketone levels is, you know, after a certain point, and there's studies that sort of back this up, as you become better and better keto adapted, particularly as athletes, you end up getting much more efficient in utilizing those ketones. Right. And so you may have a low level of ketones. And whereas 0.5, you know, you might say 3.0 is no better than 0.5, you know, so the, the point becomes how much are you making, how much are you using, how much are you wasting. Right. But I will tell you that I've seen a lot of people that do track ketones in the diet. And I would say a large percentage of them do note that they are in ketosis for much of the time, despite eating 150, 200, 250 right. grams of protein a day, which is sort of counter to what the ketogenic literature shows us. And so we're seeing that in real time and real people testing this out that, yes, you are indeed probably spending a significant period of time in ketosis on this diet. Yeah, I was seeing that Benjamin Bickman, he's a researcher, I believe, based in Utah, was saying right. that uh, – 
the gluconeogenesis story around too much protein isn't really panning out. So if you are, you know, doing very, very low carb and you have a little bit of a higher range of protein, it's not going to necessarily kick you out of ketosis, which is interesting for folks that are looking at uh, the benefits of having elevated presence of ketones for some of the signaling effects there. Um, yeah, I mean, it's like to give you a sense of a little bit of my story, I cycle in and out of a ketogenic diet uh, fairly regularly for six to eight week blocks at a time. And it sounds like a lot of the biomarker changes that you're seeing with a carnivorous carnivorous diet are reflected with like a ketogenic diet, right? You typically see a flat nining or an elevation of LDL. And there's like a question of whether that's a bad, you know, bad, bad biomarker. I think there's a lot of work showing that perhaps LDL in of itself is not a strong uh, predictor for cardiovascular risk. You see uh, elevation of HDL, lower triglycerides. So it sounds like a lot of the biomarker endpoints are similar to keto, but it sounds like the thesis here is that carnivore is like an even more restrictive or, or tighter version of keto with some potentially beneficial effects. And it sounds like with, especially with some people with like uh, uh, autoimmune diseases, uh, but you're also just seeing that like in your N equals one, you're seeing better athletic performance going carnivore beyond like a, like a typical uh, vanilla keto diet. I think it's fair to, to, to impart some evolutionary uh, speculation on, you know, if we say a ketogenic diet is, has, has benefits, whether they're cognitive, whether the ketones right. have a benefit, and then you have to say, well, what did prehistoric man do to go into a ketogenic diet? You know, he wasn't drinking bulletproof coffee. He wasn't su- right. sucking down MCT oil, right. you know, so where, how would he have restricted his fats and up restricted his carbohydrates and upped his fats? Well, if we look around what was available to him, he had a bunch of megafaunal big fat mammoths, which we clearly ate a ton of them. We clearly <laughs> hunted them. And so if you're sitting around and you have an option of, you know, foraging uh, for for uh, tubers, which by the way, back then were very fibrous and didn't yield very much calories. You right. know, they were hard, they were a lot of work to do. Or you could go out and kill a mammoth. And it's very interesting when, when I've talked to anthropologists about this and people that study humans that, that still do this, killing an elephant is not that hard for a human to accomplish, even with just spear technology. And so those animals, because they don't run, I mean, they use their size as their defense. You know, a tiger or a saber toothed cat is not going to easily take down a mammoth. So they're pretty safe. So when a, a puny little man walks up to them, they don't run away. But all of a sudden, lo and behold, they stick them with a with a spear in the side of their yeah. gut, and then they just, you know, then they bleed to death. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, they, 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 it, there's pretty good, interesting papers coming out of uh, some of the anthropology literature saying that man basically had access to mammoth meat whenever he wanted it, you know, up until about 25,000 years ago when we started to see significant die off of these animals. And then what happened is the strategy had to change. Then we had even leaner animals to get our protein. Right. We probably, you know, started, you know, breaking the bones to get more marrow, eating more of the visceral organs to get more fat. And then as that started to become more difficult, then we had to add more and more carbohydrate into our diet. And the agricultural revolution. Right. Yeah. So I think from an evolutionary standpoint, if we say ketogenic diet was good, then how would hum- human beings have done that? And I think it's just basically they would have sat there and ate a bunch of fatty animals. And right. It's not to say that they didn't eat some berries here and there. They, they didn't eat a few things here and there. But I think the primary part of their nutrition was you know, this, these, these animals that they, that they lived on. And so I think, uh, this diet sort of mimics that, uh, uh, you know, the fact that many people, as we see are, have a lot of problems with their gastrointestinal tract. I mean, I think that is becoming more and more clear that a lot of these diseases have at least a relationship to, to poor absorption, leaky gut syndrome, you know, like dysbiosis, mic- microbiome problems. And I think, uh, some of the research that I've seen, you know, the, the research group, particularly paleo medicine out of Hungary, which is kind of spearheading some of this research around the gut, is showing a very significant improvement with gut permeability mm. uh, vis-a-vis a carnivorous diet. You know, they have what they call a paleolithic ketogenic diet, which is basically a, a, a meat-based ketogenic diet with some organ meats thrown in there. But they're seeing significant improvement in gastrointestinal permeability via test using something called polyethylene glycol, which can, you know, kind of, kind of kind of tell you what our what our gut permeability is like and they're seeing significant improvement in gut permeability at the same time they're seeing biomarkers of uh, inflammation rapidly go down when they do that tumor, tumor necrosis factor alpha and uh uh things like uh, high sensitivity c-reactive protein interleukin-6 all those things drop when they go on the diet at the same time they're seeing these diseases start to remit you know autoimmune diseases in particular you know they're seeing particular success with people with Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, you know, uh, uh, well, diabetes, and, right. and all these rheumatoid arthritis, psoriatic arthritis, all these things seem to be improving 
uh, on that protocol, which and, and, and their postulation is it's coming from the gut. Interestingly, when the membrane, when the gut perme- gut gut permeability membrane is breached, there's also indication that other membranes are breached, like the blood blood brain barrier. Mm-hmm. So we may have these metal things. That's why a lot of people on the diet notice improvements in both cognition, but more importantly, well, equally as importantly, are things like mood and, and depression and, and anxiety are improving with this. And so they, they may be all related. Again, it's all speculation at this point. Right. Lots of testing needs to be done. But but the neat thing is we're seeing that data start to emerge. Hey, this is Jeff Wu jumping in here real quick to share a really nice HVMN customer testimonial. This one is from Trevor J, who's a student at Mississippi State. Let's listen to what he has to say about Sprint, our nootropic for acute focus. I take Sprint when I'm trying to write papers, when I have a test the next day, anything like that. I don't necessarily take Sprint on a daily basis, but I take it when I need it. I also take Sprint when I have soccer. I began experimenting with nootropics in soccer about my freshman year, I want to say. And so I started taking it in practice. I really liked the way I was playing, the way I was thinking. And so I took it during games and now I take it every time I play soccer. I personally don't understand why more people don't take new topics when it comes to sports because that mental side is huge when it comes to sports. You're able to think extremely clear. You're able to focus. You're narrowing in. You're not worried about who's texting you, who's Facebooking you, nothing like that. You're able to focus. Great to hear that Sprint is helping you out in both school and sport, Trevor. Thanks so much. This month's special podcast offer is 15% off our HVMN performance supplements line, which includes Sprint. Simply visit www.hvmn.com slash pod to claim the offer. Again, that is www.hvmn.com slash pod. This offer ends December 31st, 2018. Now back to the program. So what do you think in plant matter is causing these leaky gut syndromes or these like uh, the, the diffusion in, in the membranes? Is it like, is it, you know, is it the fiber? Is it the phytonutrients? Like what, what's in this plant matter that's, that's causing this? I can tell you what their research shows. And okay. So the, some of the things that they've shown, some of the food substances that tend to cause a lot of problems are vegetable oils for one. You know, okay. all these processed, industrialized canola oil, sap oil, all the all, cottonseed oil, all the soybean, all, all the stuff that's been introduced in the diet. So that causes problems. They're seeing problems with certain medications and supplements. You know, mm. some of those things tend to cause disruption of the gut membrane barrier. They are seeing problems with dairy for some people. So dairy, you know, it's not a com- a completely plant-based, but sometimes dairy can be a problem for some people. They're seeing problems with uh, sugar and sweeteners being an issue when they've tested this. So they're seeing problems with... Uh, some of the like nightshade vegetables, some of the grains, you know, the gluten, the gliadins, uh, possibly some of the lectins in the plants, those things seem to be causing problems. And I'm thinking if I'm missing one, I might be missing one, but, uh, but those, those, those are the ones that they've tested and have seen, you know, issues with. Right. So that that's, that's speculative. I mean, there's, you know, it's, it's hard to say for sure. I mean, I know we talk about phytonutrients. I mean, they're basically phytochemicals. Some of them are, can be beneficial in certain circumstances. Right. Uh, there are phy- phytochemicals that are problematic, oxalates, salicylates, you know, there's there's a whole list, you know, there's you know, right. uh, phytates, lectins, you know, they, they, they're, they're literally thousands of chemicals in these, in these different foods we eat. Right. Which ones are the culprits? You know, that, that, that may take a long time to sort out. And so while we're waiting for that to sort out, some of the answer may just be get rid of all of it for now, <laughs> fix your gut. And then what's interesting is, you know, what I see is a lot of people... Because most people, honestly, most people are not going to stay on a fully carnivorous diet for the rest of their life. You know, I don't even know that I will. But there are a lot of people that do it for three months, six months, eight months, nine months, a year. And then they notice that their tolerance to other foods has now improved. They, instead mm-hmm. of getting those joint flare-ups or skin flare-ups after they eat something, now that their gut integrity is restored, they have the capacity to uh, tolerate some of that food. You know, and, and maybe maybe it was the vegetable oils causing the problem and they just avoid that. Right. Now they can eat raspberries again or blueberries again. I think that's great. I think, you know, people kind of misinterpret what I'm saying to say I want everyone to stay on a meat-based diet only for the rest of life. I think if you can fix yourself and utilize this as a tool and then you can get back to eating some other things that you might enjoy, that's great too. Yeah, that seems a lot more sensible. It sounds like it's like a kind of a, as you see it, like a smart elimination diet in a way that reduces a lot of these biomarkers in a way that's even more strict than a ketogenic diet. And then, you know, as you, with your personal uh, subjective feeling, you can start incorporating additional foods if it, you know, fits your lifestyle, which I think seems like a sensible 
approach. If you're trying to solve a problem, you, yeah. know, you eliminate the variables. I mean, you, you drop it down to one variable, and then all of a sudden it becomes very easy. You know, well, yeah. what can I add in now? And then, yeah. and then you, you, either, you either you either can or you can't. Now, the one caveat to that is the microbiome has to reacclimate. So you might have to sort of distinguish, you know, why did I go on the diet? I went on the diet because I was depressed or I had rheumatoid arthritis. Um, you know, and, and those are the symptoms I'm trying to avoid. But if you if you go back in and you start sticking – uh, you know, uh, avocados back in there and all of a sudden, you know, as well, my guts don't feel good. Well, that's just, that could just be the microbiome readjusting. So I right. think you have to be fair when you reintroduce these things to give it a little time for your microbiome to readjust and then see now, if you still get those rheumatoid arthritis symptoms, or you still find out your mood is off for whatever reason, then it might be safe to say that, Hey man, I really still need to avoid this stuff. And so yeah. I think that's a, a way to look at it because a lot of people, you know, once they change their microbiome, you know, and that happens with any diet you change over. If I were to change over to a strict vegan diet right now, my guts would not be happy for right. neither would yours for a period of time. And I think that's just a natural thing, but we have to, we have to sort of put aside the gut microbiome from, um, you know, what other symptoms we're trying to resolve. Now, some of it's just a gut period. You know, these people with Crohn's disease or old bowel syndrome, that's kind of a special case. So we work with a lot of elite athletes and folks in the military and some of their, cons you know, and this, this is kind of an interesting, you know, gossip topic for me. Like I went on a recently, went on a three-week carnivorous diet block. I want to get back onto it because I think from a safety perspective, like I think it's 100% safe. Like if I'm on like a ketogenic diet for like long blocks of time and I see like reasonable biomarker improvements and like I, I think people going on a carnivore diet, if it's like sensible, it's like uh, kind of on par, right? Like instead of eating like some nominal amounts of like, I guess, spinach or, 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 or fibrous, uh, pl you know, plant matter, just like removing that. Like it wasn't that big of a difference for me uh, to go from a keto to a carnivore diet. Um, and I'm curious to go back on it and, and do more biomarker tracking. Um, but I think the biggest question they ask is like, how does it affect the gut microbiome? But I think you put it quite well. The gut microbiome adapts to what diet you're consuming. So there's going to be some adaptation period. But, you know, I think even when that within like the first few days of just shifting to a carnivorous diet, I felt like pretty reasonable on, on, on a carnivorous diet. It wasn't you know, like a crazy transition. And like ostensibly, you'd want your body to be metabolically flexible to have the ability to you know switch between different types of diets right like it'd be relatively fragile if you could only survive on like one specific thing all the time maybe it's optimal but like it's perhaps a sign of inflexibility in your metabolism if one could only survive on one specific thing depends on where you live you know if you if you're if you were a and would living in greenland your, your options are pretty limited so you yeah. better be able to survive on what you have around you know we yeah. obviously you know, we have every food in the world right now available to us. And if we decide we want to, we want to have some bright, I think that's fine to do if, if you want to choose to do so. And so I think you shouldn't paint yourself into a corner necessarily, but just, just to go back on the microbiome, because one of the knocks is, you know, is, you know, there's no fiber in the diet. Yeah. The fiber question. But, you know, some of it is, you know, maybe there's some animal fiber. There's people debate, you know, some of the, some of the, some of the material and animal can, yeah. can consider fiber, but, but generally the concern is, you know, we, we look at these bacteria that inhabit our, our, you know, our lower GI tract that can utilize fiber to, to convert that into short chain fatty acids like butyrate. And that has been shown to have a beneficial effect upon uh, some of the enterocytes or the colonocytes, yeah. you know, but what we're seeing further on, when we look at that biochemistry is though those short chain fatty acids are then converted to ketones, mm -hmm. right? And then those ketones have the beneficial effect on those cells. Well, guess what? If you're already on a ketogenic diet, <laughs> those cells are already going to be getting get ketones directly. They're going to get them anyway. So I mean, yeah. it's you know, it's it's kind of a you know, it's like it's it's six of one, half dozen of the other. So I mean, I, I don't buy the, the microbiome. But first of all, I think we are so so far in our infancy on understanding the microbiome, and it's so incredibly complex. I mean, look at that. We're still debating about cholesterol, and we've been studying that for you know a hundred and some years, yeah. and we still haven't figured it out. And so you're going to tell me we're going to now automatically know the right the right answer on you know a microbiome which is infinitely more complicated yeah. you know with with all the moving parts and different species and amounts change based on so many things that we can understand that now i just don't buy it so i have to think i think that the most sensible thing i've seen said about the microbiome is your microbiome is healthy when you are you know i think that that is just something you can you can kind of hang your hat on, you know, yeah. and, and, you know, instead of putting the cart before the horse and saying, you're not healthy unless you're, you have X amount of species of this sort of, there's no science behind that. I don't, I think there's some science behind it, but I don't think there's enough where you can say, this is what we need to hang our hat on. Yeah. I just don't think that's there yet. I don't know. I don't know that it'll ever be quite honestly. Yeah. That's my 
understanding of the space as well. I think there's a lot of interesting excitement in the microbiome and how that affects the brain. The gut-brain access is a popular term of, of, of research. But I think you're absolutely right that it's too early to make any broad recommendations. Um, and then I guess to get a sense of like, why do you think the fiber story is something that I, I think that you picked up on? It's such a, uh, do, you, do you think that's just like a kind of a, dogmatic thing that people have been inculcated of thinking fiber is so important. I was reading some of the uh, Travis Statham, who I, I know is like a moderator in a lot of these uh, carnivorous forums, was mentioning, I don't remember the book, but like, you know, some researchers sort of unpacking the fiber story on that it really being pushed by, you know, Mr. Kellogg trying to sell cereal back in the day. Um, why do you think that that story is so, I mean, clearly there's like reasonable data why fiber, I think, is associated with uh, better colon risk outcomes and, and colon cancer outcomes. But it seems like you're, 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 op you're starting to unpack that can of worms there. Like, what do you think is the debate there? Why don't we have the full picture yet? I think clearly there there is some scientific data to support fiber is beneficial. I don't yeah. doubt that, you know, but I think much of that research is, is based on epidemiology as is most of our nutritional research, you know, and the problem with epidemiology is it's so highly confounded there, you know, you, you know, the, the, the to, to answer the question, we really want to know it can't be done in nutrition, or at least it can't be done unless you have an extreme amount of money and volunteers are willing to live their whole life a certain way. You right. know, you know, you'd have to take a bunch of twins and lock them up in a metabolic ward and control every single variable except for diet and track them for 40 or 50 years to yep. make any real outcome. So now we're left with these, you know, second best measures. And some people will say, you know, study a bunch of numbers with epidemiology that has been widely criticized. You know, John, you know, up in your neck of the woods up in Stanford, yep. John Ioannidis has basically said the nutritional epidemiology is just awful. It's not helping us at all. It's like a Ouija board, whatever you want to, want to, want to say, you can make it happen. So that's 80% of nutrition. And yeah. then so the rest of the stuff is when you start looking at randomized control trials on fiber, you know, the ones that are involved with gut health, IBS and, and diverticulitis have been a big negative. I mean, they, they don't show any benefit at mm. all. If you look at the body literature on that, if you look at things like blood pressure, again, doesn't really make much of a difference. I saw one meta-analysis where fiber was, you know, it, it lowered the systolic blood pressure by two points. I'm like, well, big, that's like nothing. I mean, it's like, why even bother to report that? That's so minimal. Right. It, it makes no clinical impact. But what it does show is that, you know, if you have fiber in your diet, it can mitigate a glucose response. And I think that's fair to say. The problem is, um, assuming you're eating a diet that's high in glycemic type foods, you're eating a junk food diet or a sugary diet, Fiber in the diet is going to help you, sure. And again, this is a relative benefit. But if you're not eating that, if you're eating a a, a low glycemic diet or an all meat diet, God forbid, you know, you're not going to have to worry about fiber mitigating your glucose response. You know, you're not going to have a big glucose response from uh, from no carbohydrates in your diet. I mean, it, it doesn't happen. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And then the other thing is that it can lower cholesterol. You know, and that's been shown. You know, there's a modest lowering of total and LDL cholesterol. Again. We can debate whether or not that's a good thing or not. And I think that is a, a very contentious subject these days and becoming more and more contentious. There's people that obviously, it's not that cholesterol isn't a known risk factor for cardiovascular disease, but the question is, how big of a risk factor is it is to relative to other things? Right. And does it apply equally in all populations? And so if you and I are on a low-carbohydrate ketogenic diet and our cholesterol goes up, but at the same time our HDL triglycerides are more favorable, our blood pressure is more favorable, our body composition is more favorable, right. our inflammation markers are more favorable, what's the net effect there? And I think that's what we have to get into this big picture. I mean, we're not isolated variables. We're entire complicated systems. And, and, and I don't think we, you know, we can understand that. I'm not smart enough to understand it, but I'm smart enough to know that it's not based on one variable. It certainly can't be. Otherwise, you know, everybody that had a heart attack, there'd be nobody with a heart attack that, that has a cholesterol under 200. We see that all the time. <laughs> yeah. fact, the majority of people that have heart attacks have cholesterols under 200. Well said, yeah. Yeah, the wrong answer is, you know, let's just get it lower and lower and lower and lower. You know, let's get it down to zero. And there's people that are actually talking about that, that with, you know, the latest round of drugs, you know, we can, you know, was it the PSK9 inhibitors where they can just... Right you know, bring it down even lower and lower and lower. And it's just kind of like, at some point, you got to say, why do we even have cholesterol? You know, what's the purpose of cholesterol? And it has purposes. And so, you know, we, we, we can't just assume that, you know, trying to get rid of every last possibility of cardiovascular disease is not going to have a negative outcome on a whole host of other things, whether it be cancer risk, neurogenitive risk, immune susceptibility, you know, hormone problems, so on and so forth. That's well said. I mean, cholesterol is such a built, primal building block for all of our hormones. Uh, they're, they're, it's in our system for a reason. Um, 
And I think there's a lot of discussion, as you mentioned, around like, are statins actually effective? Like statins are drugs that drop LDL. And it sounds like, you know, cardiovascular risk remains the biggest killer of Americans, even though a lot of people are on these statins. So like, are these drugs even effective at this point? Or are there other mechanisms that are more of a root cause? Um, I think these are all... I, I think you, I think you paint the picture really well. There's like a system of interactions, like isolating one specific biomarker or a cholesterol marker as like the one God-given truth of like clinical predict predictive factors is, is is like too uh, is too reductionist. I would say, um, kind of like a more of a like a, a practical question. You know, when I went on a carnivorous diet, like a lot of people would ask me, you know did you poop at all? Like, you don't have any fiber. Like, how does that work? Um, and one of the things that I, you know, my GI was completely fine. Um, I would just have like less volume, I guess, would be one way to describe it. Uh, and one of the explanations that I had seen recently is that uh, most of m meat protein gets digested in the small intest intestinal tract. So it's like just not a lot of... Uh, uh, material left for the you know the large intestine um, is that kind of you know not to get overly gross but like in in the broad observation of of uh, of uh, carnivorous diets does that seem pretty reflective on kind of like the applications in in of, of like people's experiences yeah it's kind of interesting because a lot of people are doing fasting now and extending fasting and no one's out there saying well how do you you know that we're not seeing this <laughs> oh my god how do you poop I mean yeah. You know, they still, even people on fast, they still go to the bath. They still have bowel moves. Again, they're less frequent. You know, the bottom line is meat is digested in the small intestine. I mean, this is where we we digest this and we absorb that. And so we know that from looking at patients that have ileostomies. These are patients, patients that no longer have colons. And we can watch what comes out through their ileostomy pouches. And when they eat meat, uh, there's, there's, there's literature on this. And there are patients that have these will actually sit there and tell you. I've, I've talked to many of them. They'll say, the only thing that comes out is a small amount of liquid. And so you're, the volume that's that's actually reaching the colon is very small, and it tends to be just just liquid. And so some people actually end up with the converse; they end up with some you know some loose stool or some diarrhea, and that's just because the colon, which previously was used to a lot of fiber volume and having a, a relatively uh, you know, the stool that wasn't particularly wet, you know, I mean, now they're getting pure liquid. And so they have to, the colon has to, like when it was a baby, you know, when you're a baby, you're drinking just milk, you're having, you're on a pure liquid diet, right? right. So your colon has to reabsorb that fluid. If it hasn't been doing that for 20 or 30 years, right, it's not as efficient at that. And so a lot of times people will find that it takes several weeks to, before that colon kind of regains that capacity, you know, and sometimes even longer for some. But yeah, I mean, it's just a matter of you are no longer wasting what you eat. So when you're on a high fiber diet, I mean, it's kind of funny that I made, I, I had an interesting post the other day, you know, in the, in the United States, 40% of our food that we produce ends up in landfills. We waste 40% of the food we produce for, you know, in this country, the vast majority of our fruit, veg, fruits, vegetables, and bakery goods, baked goods. So that, I mean, we're wasting all that. Yeah. And then when we eat much of that, when we eat fruits and vegetables, much of that nutrition also ends up in the toilet because it goes right through us tied up in the fiber. So it's yeah. kind of funny. Uh, that's why, uh, because animal products, particularly meat is so nutrient efficient. You know, I think that's a good term, nutrient efficiency, because it's, it's just all of it is absorbed and you have very little to get rid of. And, you know, so if you, if you would analyze feces, you'd see a bunch of bacteria, you might see some, some epithelial cells that get sloughed off and a very small residuum of, you know, whatever food you didn't digest. But when you're on a plant, on, on a more heavily fiber-based diet, much of that stool volume is just a bunch of fiber, yeah. which still contains quite a bit of the nutrition that you ingested. So you kind of just, you kind of just wasted your money a little bit on that. Yeah. One question that I, you know, I'm, thoughtful about when considering a carnivorous diet is that how do you balance omega-3 fats versus omega-6s? Um, obviously, a lot of your grain-fed beef is going to be higher in omega-6s. Uh, do you try to make sure you have enough seafood or more grass-fed steaks? I mean, how does this look, look like practically? I mean, or is that something that you think about as you're just like transitioning your diet? I think in practical terms, in real world terms, I'm not convinced that that is a huge issue for someone on an all-meat diet. I think the problem we have in this country with regard to omega-6 is, is we eat just a tremendously high amount of that. And the majority of that is coming through vegetable oils, processed foods yeah. and vegetable oils. And so if we look at the absolute amount amounts of omega-3s and omega-6 in, 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 in beef in particular, it's not very much. I mean, even if you ate a lot of meat, you're not going to get very much omega-6. And I think it's more of an absolute amount than a, than, a, than a specific ratio. I mean, both of them are essential. You know, omega-6 is an essential fatty acid, yeah. just like omega-3. So you have to have some in your diet. So the right. question becomes, you know, is it 
a perfect ratio that you have to have, or is it just a certain amount? And I think probably the latter is probably more accurate. But if you're really concerned about it, you know, certainly you could you could include some fatty fish in your diet once a week, and that would jack you up, you know, relative to your omega three, your, your omega six ratio, quite easily. So if you're right. really concerned about that, and again, I think it's still debatable whether or not that ratio is is you know set in stone is something we need. You know, we base that ratio based on. Uh, wild animals. I mean, that's that's where the ratio came from. You know, so there, there's no real scientific long-term RCT that says if you have an omega-6 ratio of this, you're going to live longer than, than if you have it of that. It's more of an evolutionary argument that the, the, the diet that we think that cavemen ate right. was going to be more balanced in terms of omega-3 than omega-6 is. Right. And this is another question because, again, I, 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 as part of this journey, I've spent a lot of times talking to people that raise animals, cattle yeah. ranchers and stuff like that. And when you talk to a, a cattle rancher, you know, a lot of them will say, you know, if you put a cow out in pasture, right, they'll eat the grass. And then when in June and July, when the grass turns to seed, guess what? The first thing they'll do is eat the grass seed. And, and grass seeds are grain. So, I mean, it's, you know, the question is, what is a, a, a hmm. cow's evolutionary appropriate diet? I don't even know if we know that. So, I mean, it's, it's again, it's kind of speculative. Uh, in, in, in real world terms, the people that I've seen, and again, I've, I've looked at literally thousands of people doing this diet now, and, and you know, because I've become this focal point, the people that are eating grain fed beef tend to be, in, in, from, from the best I can tell, in just as good a health as the people that eat grass fed beef. Interesting. So I, so, I don't think there's, uh, you know, and it's funny because I have an affiliation with Butcher Box, and so if I were out here and say everybody needs to eat grass-fed beef, I would actually you know, be better off financially. But yeah. I want to just be as objective and and uh, you know as honest as I can about that. And I have not seen a big difference on this, and so I think that uh, uh, you know there may be reasons. It may turn out that eating grass-fed beef is is ultimately better for us than eating wild caught. This, you know, I mean, intuitively it does seem to make sense. I don't, yeah. I, I, I'm not going to deny that argument, but I'm just saying from the objective data. Uh, Texas A&M did a study oh, a few years back where they actually compared grass-fed grain-finished beef on biomarkers looking at things like blood pressure, HDL, LDL, and, so, and triglycerides, I think. And they saw really no difference, you know, in, in the people who were – now, these, granted, these people weren't on a carnivorous diet, but they saw basically no difference. And in fact, I think that study slightly favored grain-finished beef. And so, I, again, I, I just don't – you know, maybe the data will come in. Maybe we – you know, as more and more people do this diet, maybe we can get those studies where we can we can do some RCTs where you go, you guys eat grain fed, you guys eat grass fed, and let's see how people fare. Interesting. Now again, we can debate about what biomarkers are appropriate. I mean, that's you know, again, that's an endless argument. But I mean, um, for now, I can't make a blanket statement saying that everybody should eat grass fed beef or everybody needs to eat organ meats or everybody needs to eat this. What I just said, I, I just. I think that is, you know, in practical terms, you know, maybe, you know, maybe in, in Silicon Valley, you guys that have the access, you can buy whatever you want. Most people aren't in that situation. Many people are like, I, I'm barely scraping by, man. I, I, all I can do is go get the cheap ground beef at Kroger's or whatever. Right. And I think that's okay too. I, I, I think to, to sit there and tell people avoid the diet and, and price them out of being able to do the diet is doing people disservice because, you know, in my mind, it doesn't seem to to make much of a difference yet. Now, maybe yeah. it'll change. I think that's sensible. Yeah, I know we could probably go on for a, 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 another like hour here, but I know we need to wrap up here. So, what you know, you know, what's next for you? I mean, it sounds like like the carnivore tribe is growing. <laughs> it sounds like you're getting a lot of success. You know, starting to spin up the RCT versions of what is happening uh, in the community as n equals one. Um, you know, you're on Twitter. Where do people follow you? And like, what are some big projects for the rest of the year in 2019? I've got a book coming out. It's at the editor right now. It'll be published, I think, early next year called The Carnivore Diet, surprisingly. You know, very surprising name. But yeah. uh, that's going to be coming out. I'll, I'll, I'll probably do some speaking. I've been invited to do some speaking things. I'll, I'll probably, you know, kind of do that stuff. I do, so I do some online consulting with people that, that want to get more specifics on how to implement it and dealing with their, in fact, that's what I'm going to do right after this. You know, we, I, I, I talk to people about how to, how this might be incorporated in their diet. And, and I talk about, other, you know, cause I've got other tools in my toolbox. I've been an athlete my whole life. So I, I understand athleticism and performance and those things as well. Um, but I think the, the real thing is it's, it's, it's just wanting to be a part of it as this grows. And as we challenge some of the, some of the conventional dogma out there, and it's not that, all of it's wrong, but I think some of it's wrong, and I think we need to 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 use this as a catalyst to say, okay, well, let's let's really test these things because I think a lot of assumptions were made about health and nutrition back a hundred years ago, which were not really based on, you know, like like for instance, when human beings adopted agriculture and a grain based diet, 
we didn't do an RCT to determine if that was healthy for everybody, right? right? We just did it. We yeah. just did it. And yeah. for, for better or for worse, that's what we're stuck with. And so, again, the same thing, you know, we, we just kind of assume that humans have to have a, a wide variety of foods in their diet. And I, I'm my question is, maybe we don't. Maybe we can live on a, you know, maybe we can do just like a, like a, like a lion or a zebra does. And we can eat kind of a monotonous diet and thrive. Maybe that's the key, key to, to thriving. Yeah. You know, maybe it's not the funnest way to do it. Maybe it's boring. And maybe the fact that, you know, we don't have 50 different flavors of Gatorade that we can drink, uh, you know, maybe that's upsetting to some people. But I mean, ultimately, I think the truth is going to come out here if people want to pursue that. And, and like I said, all I want to do is, you know, it's exciting for me to see people resolving lifelong illnesses. I, you know, I, you know, whether you lose weight and get a six pack and, you know, whatever, whatever, that's all fine and dandy and that's nice. But really what's motivating me is when I see these people that are literally, I mean, they have tried and failed everything in their lives have been turned upside down by various illnesses and that goes away and they, and they, and now they can live again. To me, that is why I do this and why I continue to do this and why I put up with all the, you know, the crazy insults and attacks and, you know, ad hominem things that, that come my way every single day. I mean, yeah. I, I'm constantly, you know, uh, you know, I'm painted as some kind of, you know, evil Hitler guy because I'm advocating people eat animals, you know, and I'm like, but you're quite sensible. I think our conversations are quite civil and quite sensible, right? <laughs> well, I mean, that's yeah. the thing, but you know, social media is, is a circus, right? And you know, it's, it's, it's hype and it's, it's, you know, this stuff, and it's hard to come across in a, in a 280 character tweet, you know, a, a logical, well thought out. And that's why I like doing these, these talks and talking yeah. to people in real life because they see that there's, there's nuance here. There's subtlety there and there's, there's compromise here, but you know, at the same time, if you don't do the silly stuff, you know, and I think our, our presidential elections can appoint to that. If you don't get the attention, you know, if you don't, if no one, if no one can hear you, it doesn't matter what your message is. Right. So you got You got to sometimes wear the funny wig and be the clown. <laughs> so people will see who you are and then they'll, then they'll at least stop by and take a notice and listen. They'll spend five minutes listening. And some of those people will, will listen and say, wait a minute, there's some sense here. And they try it and they get better. But I think that's, 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 you know, that's, that's the nature of social media, quite honestly. Performance starts to get the message out there. Well, thanks so much for taking the time to, you know, engage in this conversation. Um, I think, uh, I think whatever the hype or the, the, the buzz around the carnivorous diets, I think you, I think you're, you're qu well, quite sensible here. And I think it's something that, you know, I think is interesting. I want to do more experiments myself personally. So I'll we'll have to have you back on when the book comes out and all of that. So, sure. uh, appreciate the time, Sean. Jeff, I appreciate it, man. Have yeah. a good day. And maybe I'll get up. There. I think I got to go up to San Francisco next month or something. Maybe yeah, I'll drop a sign. Visit. Yeah. That area. Cool. All right, man. Cheers. Well, awesome. Thanks. Take, take care. If you enjoyed this episode with Sean and want to hear more from him, check out the Carnivore Cast. It's a podcast for carnivores by carnivores. Here's a short clip from their episode 17 featuring Sean, where he theory crafts why early humans may not have seeked out organ meat. 25,000 years ago or so, we had a, a big selection of large fatty animals, mammoths, mastodons, elephants. And by the way, they were about three times the size that they are now in many cases. So the big, big animals, lots of fat on them. They're 60% fat by weight typically. So you had plenty of opportunity, or by calorie rather, but you had plenty of opportunity to get plenty of fat by eating these animals and probably just eating their flesh, you know, without having to necessarily delve into the organs. I mean, there's a lot of people that don't like the taste of organs. And I think it's the same thing with bitter plants. You know, why don't we eat bitter plants? Because they're not necessarily in our best interest. And so why would we not like the taste of organs? Would it dissuade us from eating it 50,000 years ago like it does for many people today? I think probably it would have. Now, when those animals died off, and this is what we see in the fossil record, we don't really see marrow-seeking behavior prior to about 25,000 years ago. And so that's when these animals died off. And then so man is now left with not many big animals that have big, fatty, fleshy ribeyes on them. Now we've got these leaner animals. And so now where are we going to get our fat from? Well, we're going to eat the brains. Your brains are fatty. We're going to suck the marrow. We're going to eat them, the organs because they have all this omental fat and perinephric fat and pericardial fat and intestinal fat. Now, this is our fat source. And then, of course, when that doesn't hold up, then we've got to add carbs in. And so I think really that organ-seeking behavior that we saw early on was probably fat-seeking behavior. Thanks so much for tuning in this week, everyone. Remember to check out www.hvmn.com forward slash pod for this month's special podcast offer. For December 2018, that is 15% off our entire HVMN Performance Supplements line. The perfect gift for your friends, your family, or just treat yourself. Are you interested in getting $15 of HVMN store credit that you can use on our website? 
I thought so. Submit a written review on our iTunes page and then send a screenshot to podcast at hbmn.com. That email line is always open for guests, topic ideas, feedback and questions. So until next week, listeners, stay sharp and train smart.